Okay, guys, um, this is my first attempt at a video lecture. Um, so I'm going to try to edit as much stuff out as I can. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm recording this on March 17th, uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, so basically, because of the cancellation of class, we're going to condense four chapters of Stokestad into one quiz. So that's going to be Stokestad 5, 6, 7, 8, and nine, I believe. No, no, it's five, six, seven, and eight. Um, so bearing that in mind, I'm going to try to condense and summarize this video lecture as much as possible. Uh, so I might be skipping over some stuff. That doesn't mean that it's not important. It just means that it's not on the quiz. So hopefully this video lecture will kind of help you focus on the material that's important for the quiz um, and kind of lessen the burden of all those chapters. Um, so yeah, that being said, I'm going to do my best. This is my first attempt at this. Um, so please bear with me and be patient. Uh, I'm going to upload this to Blackboard and try to post it on YouTube. If you have any questions, you can always uh, message me or post comments on the YouTube page. Um, so here we go. We'll do it. Okay, so all of these chapters are pretty closely related, as you'll see, so I think it makes sense to condense them into one. Um, we'll start with uh, chapter five, Art of Ancient Greece, which kind of builds off the stuff that we covered uh, in chapter four. So this is the same geographic area, um, the Aegean, although as you'll see, they kind of expand outward. Um, there's basically five periods um, that our historians tend to divide Greek art into. Um, that's geometric, orientalizing, archaic, classical and Hellenistic. Um, the origin of art history as a discipline um, is basically the study of Greek statues um, in the 18th century um, by people working for the Vatican. Um, so there is this tendency to kind of idealize classical Greek art and what they call high classical is kind of like uh, the peak of ancient artistic production and kind of like a level of perfection. Um, Although, as we'll see, a lot of the assumptions that they've made about classical Greek art have been proven to be false. Um, but there is this idea of kind of like a linear or teleological progression um, that art historians kind of projected onto this artwork. Uh, there's some specialized vocabulary that we'll have to deal with, not too much. Um, we'll talk about the lost wax process, which you guys are already familiar with, but there are certain like ceramic vessel types, um, different parts of Greek architecture. Um, that have specialized vocab words that you'll need to know. Um, we'll start with this piece, um, which is a type of amphora that wasn't really actually used for storing anything. It was basically like either for funerary offerings or a prize for things in like the Olympic Games and stuff like that. Um, it's called a black figure amphora um, for the simple reason that the figures are done in black slip. Um, the artist has scraped away uh, the black slip to expose the raw terracotta um, in the background and incised lines on the figures. Um, this one is kind of interesting because the ceramicist and the painter are the same artist, Exekius, um, and he signed the artwork. That's pretty typical um, for Greek vase painting. Usually the, both the ceramicist and the painter um, will sign the work, which is kind of unusual uh, for the artwork that we've seen so far. The artists usually remain anonymous, although we did see that the Mayan artists also worked as a team um, and signed the artwork. Um, in this one, we can see two heroes from uh, Greek epic poetry, uh, Ajax and Achilles, who were uh, fighting in the Trojan War. Um, in this example, they're kind of hanging out uh, and playing a game. Um, this scene would have been somewhat ironic uh, for Greek viewers because they would have known that Achilles was going to be killed um, in the Trojan War, um, and that Ajax would kill himself, commit suicide, um, due to his grief for his lost comrade. So this moment of kind of conviviality between the two of them has this kind of like darker meaning um, underneath of it for the Greek viewer. Um, so amphoras, uh, most of them were utilitarian. I'm just okay, um, so, like I said, that amphora with Ajax and Achilles is kind of like a 
a fancy amphora that wouldn't actually be used. Um, most amphoras were kind of what we call a courseware. They were used as a shipping container. Um, this is a good example of one. You notice that it doesn't have any decoration at all. Um, and the base is kind of like a point instead of that uh, flat base that we saw on the prize amphora that would help it stand up. Um, so uh, this amphora is basically the shape is totally determined by its function as a shipping container for things like wine, olives, uh, wheat, anything really, dry goods, wet goods. Um, it has that pointed base to allow it um, to be stood up in the sand, say, um, and also to be kind of packed into the hold of a ship. Uh, the handles are for transportation, but also for uh, lashing it into the cargo hold of a ship and also loading it with a crane. Um, so this is like a totally functional object compared to the one that we were looking at. Um, you can see it uh, standing in this like metal tripod um, that was just built by the museum. I'm setting my phone on silent, sorry about that. Um, this is a nice mosaic uh, from Ostia, which was like the main seaport of Rome, but you can see a sailor uh, loading an amphora over his shoulder onto a ship there. Um, and this is a reconstruction of a Greek sailing vessel with amphoras loaded into the hold. Um, and apparently they would load these like pretty heavily into the ship, just like a modern cargo ship that you might see in the Chesapeake Bay um, with shipping containers kind of stacked up on the deck. Um, and to the right, you can see guys using a type of boom um, to load the amphora uh, into the hold. Um, this would result in a lot less breakage and a lot less labor for the sailors. Um, they would have been sealed with goat skin, um, which would have been put on wet and then as it dried, it would basically seal up. Um, pretty much airtight, basically, like a drum. Um, these are just some other examples of the uh, shipping type of amphora. Um, a lot of these have been covered from shipwrecks, intact, sometimes with uh, the material still inside. Um, this one has spent quite a bit of time at the bottom of the sea, as you can see. Um, this is a shot of Monte Testaccio um, in Rome, which you can see through the archway uh, with a cross on top. Um, this is another shot of it here. Uh, it's basically used for Easter celebrations in Rome. Um, it's kind of a stand-in for Mount Calvary, or Calvary, not sure, I'm not a good Christian boy. Um, but anyway, uh, it's basically made of discarded amphora. They were so plentiful and cheap that usually when they reached their destination, they would be recycled in some way. Um, this mountain or hill was basically made of olive oil amphora um, that were transported from what's now Guadalquivir in Spain. Um, but because the olive oil kind of saturated the ceramic, it wasn't really possible to recycle them. Um, so basically they made this like huge dump of broken amphora. Um, and you can see the fragments there um, in the grass in the foreground. So uh, basically the Roman Empire imported so much olive oil that they had to build this mountain of broken amphora, basically. It, they did it really carefully with like engineering and retaining walls and stuff like that. Um, but it's a feature of the Roman landscape today. Um, so yeah, the one that we're looking at is not one of those shipping amphora. It's a prize amphora, which could be given out like basically for people that won events in the Olympic games, things like that. Um, and like I said, we have this kind of scene of Ajax and Achilles. Um, Ajax is on the right, he calls out three which kind of emerges from his mouth and kind of like a speech bubble. Um, and Achilles comes back with four, um, the winning number. Um, and you can see uh, Ajax on the right there with no helmet and then uh, Achilles on the left with his helmet kind of tipped back. Um, and they're basically calling out the numbers. Achilles is winning the game. Um, there are other painted amphora that show kind of the rest of the narrative. In this one, we can see Ajax bringing back the body of the dead Achilles from the battlefield. Um, there's a woman mourner to the left. Um, and you might notice that uh, the gender convention that we saw in ancient Egyptian art and Aegean art with women being kind of lighter and men being darker is continued here. Um, this one is at the Walters. Uh, and on the back, um, there's this kind of intense battle scene um, depicting the Trojan War that we can see there. Um, this is another uh, painted amphora, and here we can see 
basically the next step in the narrative, um, Ajax getting ready to commit suicide in grief over his lost comrade. Um, so basically, we're seeing uh, Greek civilization in the Mediterranean emerging from those Aegean uh, cultures that we looked at previously. Um, the big change uh, that we see in Greek art is that it's constantly evolving, unlike Egyptian art, which basically stayed the same for millennia. Um, this is the map of the area that we're going to look at. Um, the Aegean uh, is kind of like the Greek heartland. Um, there are different city-states that emerge there uh, on mainland Greece, mainly in this case. Uh, but as we'll see, the Greeks kind of expand um, both east and west into what's now Turkey um, and Italy. Um, so uh, the city-states that form after Mycenaean rule, Athens, Corinth, and Sparta are the most prominent ones. Um, Athens is usually held up as kind of like the beginning of representative democracy. Um, although citizenship was only open to Athenian men, um, so the democracy was pretty limited. Uh, the census of 309 BCE in Athens lists 21,000 citizens, 10,000 foreign residents, um, and 400,000 others, that is women, children, and slaves. So they were a slaveholding society. Um, Greek sanctuaries are a little bit different than the Egyptian ones, which have that axial pattern that we saw. They're kind of arranged on a central avenue. Um, the Greek monuments and temples are kind of more like the Mayan cities and that they conform to the topography. Um, and they were also collaborations of different city-states usually, as we'll see. Um, we see a lot of ceramics from Athens throughout the Mediterranean world, like the Etruscans, for example, loved Athenian ceramics. Um, there's a lot of cultural and economic exchange. Um, and through that exchange, what are considered exotic foreign motifs from the Near East kind of show up in Greek art. Um, the earliest period that we're going to look at is the geometric period. Um, we're going to see some examples of uh, ceramics used as grave markers. Um, the funerary crater from the Met um, is a good example of geometric art. Um, and this thing is pretty big. It's about like four feet tall. Um, probably was never used for actually mixing wine. It's just basically used as like a grave marker. Um, but it's a great example of what came to be called the geometric style by art historians. Um, so we can see uh, two registers, basically. Um, in the top register, we can see a funeral scene. Um, in the center, we can see the dead man basically laid out on a funerary bier. Um, to the right and left, there are mourners who are tearing their hair out. And you can see that the artist has basically reduced the human figures to kind of simple geometric shapes, um, hence the name of the style. Uh, the checkerboard pattern that's kind of above the dead man uh, is a funeral shroud that's being draped over him. Um, and we get kind of a weird perspective where we can see like all four legs of the funerary bier um, with a little bit of diminishing size, kind of an odd intuitive perspective. Um, and then uh, in the second register below that, we can see uh, warriors with these kind of hourglass shaped shields um, and riding chariots uh, with horses in a kind of strange overlapping pattern. All of the negative space is basically filled up with geometric abstraction. Um, this is a really similar uh, vessel, in this case an amphora, uh, with about this, basically the same funerary iconography, just a little bit smaller. Um, so this one again was probably used uh, as a grave marker, not actually for storage. Um, but we can see the same motifs. Um, in the top register, we can see the deceased uh, on the funeral bier, um, the mourners to the right and the left tearing your hair out, um, and the checkerboard uh, shroud over top of them. And then in the second register below, we can see the warriors with the hourglass shields um, and the chariots. So this is a close up here. You can see the dead man laid out horizontally um, on the funeral bier, and then the, the mourning women tearing their hair out to the right and left, and then one actually uh, below the funeral beer um, and the checkered shroud up top. And again, like all the negative space is kind of filled up with this geometric abstraction. Um, we'll take a look at some bronze sculpture from this period as well. Um, man and centaur is basically contemporaneous to the funerary crater. This would have been an offering in a temple 
Um, combat between humans and centaurs is kind of a common theme in Greek art into the classical period, as we'll see. Um, this is pretty small. Uh, so we can see the man on the left and the centaur on the right. It's a little bit hard to see in this angle, um, but the man is stabbing the centaur in the ribs with a spear. You can kind of see it a little bit better there. Um, but again, we have these like really simplified, uh, abstracted human figures. Um, and again, like all of the kind of negative space of the sculpture is kind of filled up with geometric abstractions, um, even the bottom of the base. Uh, in the Orientalizing period, we see this influence from Near Eastern art. Um, this Corinthian Olpe is a good example. Um, so we have multiple registers with animals um, in black figure. And instead of geometric shapes filling up the negative space, um, we get these little uh, patterns called rosettes. Um, the level of naturalism is higher. It's a little bit more sophisticated depiction uh, of the animals than we saw in the geometric period. This is a nice example of an amphora in this style from the Walters. Um, but we can see the same elements, multiple registers, black figure, animals, uh, rosettes in the negative space. Um, and if we get up close, we can see how the artist has kind of incised into the black slip um, to get those rosettes and kind of definitions of the animals. Um, the archaic period uh, is the next step, um, usually means antiquated, um, but it is kind of like a period of flourish, flourishing, fluorescence. Um, in Greek civilization, there's big public works, uh, temples, uh, ceramics, things like that. Um, the first piece that we'll look at from the archaic period uh, is the assemblage from a warrior's burial uh, at the Walters. Um, and this is not really from like the center of Greek civilization. It's kind of from like the rural outskirts. Um, so it's a little bit less refined than the stuff that we would see from like Athens or Corinth. Um, but it's basically what a warrior was cremated with. Um, so we start with this helmet, um, which was actually worn. Um, you can see a negative space in the center where a crest would have been with like horse hair probably, kind of like a mohawk shape um, made of organic material that probably burnt up um, in the cremation and deteriorated over time. Um, it's made of bronze. Uh, the face is kind of open. There's these big sweeping cheek guards. Um, this is a type that's called uh, Illyrian. Um, and like I said, this one would have been actually used. Um, the other elements from the assemblage are kind of disposable elements um, made just for the funeral and the cremation. Um, they're made of gold. Uh, you can see a diadem, which is kind of like a headband. Um, there's kind of like a fake ring on the left there um, that, again, wasn't really worn in life. It was just sort of made for this uh, disposable funeral ceremony. Um, a mask made of gold um, and a nose that would have been sewn onto it. There are holes that are still visible um, where that would have been sewn into the, the rest of the mask. Um, and you can see the mask has something that's called the archaic smile, kind of a hallmark of the period. Basically, they have this weird little smile no matter what's happening to them, whether they're being burnt up in a funeral pyre, have an arrow in their ribs, doesn't matter. They always have the same expression. Um, so yeah, this is kind of simple stuff that was just made for this funeral ceremony. This is a reconstruction of what they all would have looked like together. Um, and uh, basically we can see, yeah, the helmet, a couple different angles of that. Um, this is a later type of helmet called a Chalcidian type helmet. Um, you can see that it has a little bit of a nose guard um, and the cheeks are kind of hinged there. Um, Helmets were the private property of the soldiers that owned them and getting your helmet and shield, um, it was all custom made just for you and it was basically like a mark of your passage into manhood. Um, and these were worn by a type of infantry called hoplites um, who would advance together in a formation called a phalanx basically. They would link their shields together, um, insert their spears uh, through the gaps in the shield kind of march forward together, almost like a tank. Um, this is uh, a relief of hoplites marching in formation, and you can see their uh, shields overlapping there um, as they would have marched into battle. Um, this is a ceramic where we can see a clash of two phalanxes 
Um, and you can see it like a boy with pipes kind of like providing music as they advance against each other. Um, but this is basically the way that uh, battles were fought in ancient Greece instead of kind of one on one. They would sort of charge against each other in these tight formations, kind of like you would see in the American Civil War. Um, so the helmet was really important, the shield was really important, um, and then the greaves, which covered the shins, the area that was exposed underneath the shield, that was really important. Um, and this was all kind of like the personal property of the individual soldier. It wasn't issued by the government or anything like that. So um, that's the Chalcidian type. Um, this is the Corinthian type, which is probably more familiar. It's kind of leaked into uh, popular culture. Um, this is kind of recognizably Greek. Um, has a more advanced nose guard. The cheek guards kind of come in further. Um, this would have also had a crest, although again, that would have been made of organic material um, that either burnt or deteriorated. Um, a lot of helmets were offered in temples and they would be kind of purposely destroyed uh, for that purpose. Um, this one, it's called Corinthian because the goddess Athena would wear one on Corinthian coins, but they really made them everywhere. It was kind of a standard uh, style. Um, going back to the assemblage of the warrior's burial, um, looking at the mask, we talked about the archaic smile shaped on a, a wooden matrix. Probably it's really thin gold that would have been hammered onto like a preform to give it that face shape, but uh, you can see the archaic smile there. Um, so basically, these elements would have been placed on the deceased warrior, and he would have been placed on a pile of wood essentially and set on fire. Um, and that fire. Um, gives kind of a unique color to the gold elements, um, kind of turns them purple. Um, the, uh, all this stuff um, basically uh, is Greek. The other stuff that was buried of him, buried with him was kind of like local barbarian stuff. So he's kind of like a mix of Greek and foreign. Um, we can really see a lot of similarity between uh, the mask and the mask of Agamemnon that we saw with the Mycenaean. Uh, burial, so there's definitely a direct cultural connection between the two. Um, and you can really see the purple discoloration in the diadem um, from the heat of the funeral pyre. Um, moving on, we can look at uh, archaic temple complex, a sanctuary at Delphi. Um, so basically this was a place um, where the god Apollo was believed to communicate with humans um, through a priestess, an oracle, basically. Um, she would sit on a tripod, um, and there are different interpretations of what actually happened. Um, the main idea is that she was kind of seated over a geological fault um, through which toxic gas was venting. She would kind of huff this gas and hallucinate, um, and then that would be kind of translated into some like prediction of the future where the god Apollo was kind of like talking through her. Um, she was called the Pythia, um, and this was like a really mainstream thing. Greek leaders from all over the Greek world would basically come here um, to ask questions of the oracle. Um, and if they brought basically like bribes and payment, they could cut in line. Um, so for that reason, um, all of the different city-states have a treasury at this site, um, basically where they would store those kind of payments or bribes. Um, so this is an aerial view of the sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi. Um, so there's the temple to Apollo in the center, which is kind of rectangular. Um, all the different city-states have their kind of smaller treasuries kind of surrounding it. Um, this is a theater here, and they also had a track um, for track and field events. Uh, so, and this is a reconstruction of the whole thing. And you can see uh, all the different city-states um, with their treasury halls, different altars, stuff like that. So um, all of these independent city-states that were um, often at war with one another would kind of come together here um, to ask questions of the, the Themis or the Pythia, um, this priestess that would kind of tell them the future, answer their questions. Um, the treasury of the Scythians is the one that we're going to look at. Um, it was built uh, in the sanctuary uh, by basically people from the city-state of Sipnos. Um, and it has a, an architectural feature that's important, uh, caryatids, um, which we'll see in other buildings. Um, but they're basically columns carved in the form of women. You can see them there. So that's going to be on the quiz, caryatids. 
um, columns carved into the form of female figures. Um, this is a pretty good example uh, of archaic uh, building styles. And we'll look at the frieze, um, which is kind of the relief sculpture up at the top here. Um, we'll look at that pretty closely as well. Um, so uh, there's some pretty interesting uh, artist, artistic techniques used here to create a sense of space or recession, um, overlapping being the main one. Um, that's on the pediment. Um, this is a close up here. So this is basically um, a theme that we'll see repeated throughout Greek art, the battle between um, the Olympian gods and the Titans who were kind of the gods that preceded them. Um, so uh, like I said, we'll see that later. Um, but we have lots of overlapping. We can see the various factions arrayed in phalanxes uh, with the shields overlapping. Um, there are different examples of uh, temple styles. Um, all of this stuff is basically done in what's called the Doric order of architecture. There are three main Greek orders of architecture that you need to know, the Doric, the Ionic, or the Ionian, um, and then the Corinthian. Um, there are a few different ways to tell these orders apart. I'm not going to quiz you on all of the different vocab that distinguishes these three orders. Um, we'll kind of go through the techniques for telling them apart in a second here. Um, this is the basic plan uh, for a Doric order temple um, based on uh, kind of like the golden rectangle. Um, the cella or naos um, is kind of the central area. Um, and then there's kind of a porch surrounded by columns. Um, this is a really good example of a Doric order temple. Um, the Temple of Hera um, from Poseidonia, um, which was a Greek colony in what's now Italy. Um, it's in Campania. They make amazing buffalo mozzarella there if you ever go there. Um, but yeah, this is a good example of a Doric order temple. Um, and basically the way that you can distinguish the Doric order, um, there's two ways. The capitals, that is like the top of the columns are really plain and minimal. And there's no base at the bottom of the column. Um, it's resting directly on what's called the stylobate. Um, the base of the temple looks kind of like a set of stairs. Um, and I'll show you some close-up details there uh, to distinguish those later. Um, the Temple of Aphia on Aegina um, is another pretty good example uh, of this type. Um, the columns tend to look straight, but they actually bulge out. Um, it's basically to make the temple look more uh, perfect and rectangular. Um, it's basically correcting um, an optical illusion that would make it seem kind of curved. It's just like a trick of human vision. Um, but the artists and architects compensated for that by making the columns kind of bulge out. So it looks more geometric and perfect than it would be. Um, but again, you can see these really plain capitals, um, the column resting directly on the stylobate. Um, the pediment uh, of this temple is gone. It's back basically in Germany now. We'll look at that um, in a minute. But before that, we'll kind of go through these differences of the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders. Um, so uh, this is a comparison of the three types. Um, basically, the way that you can tell them apart um, is one way that we already talked about. Uh, the Doric order doesn't have a base on the column. It's just resting directly on the stylobate. Um, the other way to tell them apart is through the capitals, that is like the top of the columns. All this other vocab stuff you don't need to know. Um, but basically, Doric, super plain, um, Ionic, we get these volutes. Um, and then the Corinthian is the fanciest um, with this imitation of a plant called the acanthus plant. Um, and I'll show you some examples. So this is the Doric order, the columns resting directly on the stylobate. It's going to be on the quiz. Um, so that's the way you distinguish a Doric column. It's resting directly on the stylobate, no base. Um, can keep going this way. Uh, this is an example of the capital of a Doric column. So there's no real decoration on it. It's very plain. Um, some other shots of one of those. This is an Ionic or Ionian capital. You can see it has that spiral shaped volute. Um, and again, that's based on like Greek ideas of perfection um, going back to the golden ratio. Um, another example of an Ionian or Ionic column with a capital. Um, you can see those big spiral volutes 
and another one there. So if you see those big spirals, it's Ionic or Ionian. Um, this is an example of a Corinthian capital. So you can see the volutes are still there. They're just much smaller. Um, and the design is kind of dominated by this vegetable or plant motif, which is Im an imitation of an actual plant uh, called an acanthus, um, which you can see here, kind of like arugula. Um, it has this blossom uh, coming up through the top um, that sometimes shows up on the columns. Um, this is another an example of a Corinthian column. Um, this is another nice one where we can see the spiral volutes as well as depictions of the flowers up there. Um, so the Temple of Aphia on Aegina um, is a Doric order temple. Um, the pediments were taken to Munich. Um, they originally had paint. Um, there's kind of like this common misconception that goes back to the 19th century that all Greek sculpture was like perfect and white, which is kind of like actually a racially loaded conception. Um, but they were originally painted in these kind of bright garish colors. Um, this is a reconstruction of what the temple would have looked like. Um, and this is the whole complex here. Um, so uh, there's figurative sculpture from the pediment um, that are now in Munich. Um, it's basically the, th the theme of the pediment is the participation of local warriors in the Trojan War. Um, in the center, we'll see Athena as a warrior goddess. Um, she kind of fills up the, the peak of the triangle of the pediment. Um, she's also larger because of hierarchical scale. Um, and this is the reconstruction of the pediment um, in Munich. Um, so you can see how it would kind of fit into the isosceles triangle um, of the pediment. Um, with Athena there in the center, um, and then the human figures kind of uh, fitting into the narrowing space of the pediment on the right and the left. Um, it seems like there were two different workshops um, that worked on the figures uh, for this pediment. So we'll see this figure is kind of like more simple, more typically archaic. Um, and then we'll see another dying warrior on the other side that's a little bit more naturalistic and sophisticated that may have been made at a later date by a different workshop. Um, but this is a dying warrior. Um, you can see that he has that archaic smile, um, even as he's pulling uh, either a spear or an arrow um, out of his chest. Um, he still has that same expression. Um, there is a pretty high level of naturalism in the torso. Um, we can see the muscles under the skin, um, a kind of rotation of the figure. Um, even still, it's a little bit stiff. Um, on the west pediment, uh, that, yeah, that's the one that we're looking at. It's kind of uh, a little bit stiff. This is the guy uh, on the east pediment, um, which is a little bit more dynamic, um, twisting a little bit more dramatically. Um, facial expression is still pretty flat, um, but it's just a higher level of naturalism than the other one, um, which makes us think that it was made by a different shop at a later date. Um, all of these sculptures have basically the remains of what's called polychrome, um, basically paint uh, on the sculptures. If you uh, go and check them out up close, you can see kind of like the remains of that paint. Um, and if you, you look at them with a microscope, you can really see it. Um, but this is a reconstruction of what these figures actually would have looked like at the time. So they would have been quite brightly painted. Um, this archer is supposed to represent basically like a barbarian or a Trojan. Um, he's got this kind of like diamond pattern. The fact that he's wearing pants also marks him as a barbarian or a foreigner. Um, it's, some people think it's supposed to represent uh, Paris, the, like the Trojan warrior that stole Helen. Um, this is what it actually looks like in the museum today. So you can see all of the polychrome uh, is basically invisible to us. Um, so there was this misconception um, that all Greek sculpture was basically this like pure uh, white uh, minimalist kind of perfect form, but they were really, really brightly painted. Um, there's another theory about the workshops producing the figures on the Western and Eastern pediments. Basically, the one was more conservative and the one was more progressive. So they have different styles. You can definitely say that. Uh, freestanding sculpture. Um, Basically, we'll see a really similar to uh, Egyptian artwork. Um, these are figures called uh, Kore um, and Koros. Uh, Kore is a young woman. Uh, Koros is a young man. Um, these are basically like fertility symbols, although they could also be uh, grave markers. 
um, they usually have that archaic smile uh, that we talked about. This is an example of a koros. Um, so you can see it has that same pose that we saw in Egyptian art, like very rigid, uh, one foot in front of the other, uh, but it's very stiff. You can kind of get the sense of the block of stone that it was carved out of. There's no facial expression of any kind, um, not super naturalistic. Um, we'll check out some other, uh, the Berlin Kore um, and the Anabaisos Koros. Um, so this is the Berlin Kore um, showing a female figure. Uh, she's clothed, um, still pretty stiff. You can see a little bit of the polychrome uh, on her. Um, this is the Anavisos Koros male figure. Um, we're getting a little bit more naturalistic. Uh, the softness of the skin and the muscles and stuff like that is there. The pose is still very, very stiff. Um, and there's no facial expression of any kind. Um, the Peplos Kore, another female figure, um, Again, more naturalistic than what we've seen so far. We can see remnants of the polychrome, uh, but still very stiff and block-like. Uh, this is a similar figure from the Walters, uh, the statuette of a woman, very tiny, um, made of bronze as opposed to stone. Uh, the reason why this one is interesting is because uh, it's clearly a Greek figure um, based on the hairstyle and the facial expression, uh, but she's wearing Egyptian clothing. Um, and this was probably made in a Greek colony, trading colony in Egypt. Um, so it's kind of a hybrid piece. Um, this one's a little weird because it has no provenance. That is, there's no like history of ownership. Um, as we've seen, a lot of uh, fake stuff kind of turned up in the Walters. Um, so this is kind of like a little bit dubious. Um, basically, they conclude that it's legitimate, but there's no way uh, of knowing. Um, it was bought uh, from a guy named Dickren Kalikian, um, who was a really prominent art, art dealer in New York and Paris. Um, he sold a lot of stuff um, to Henry Walters, as we'll see. Um, these are just some other photographs of the figure. Um, Kalikian said it was found in Greece, um, but we don't really know where he got it from. Um, but yeah, it has this kind of interesting hybrid style with a Greek hairstyle, Greek facial expression. Um, but then this Egyptian clothing, um, probably related to this Greek colony called Nalkratis. Um, the Egyptians didn't really trust the Greeks, um, so they kept them to this kind of like city on the coast where they could kind of keep an eye on them and control them. Um, and uh, this is kind of prior to the Persian domination of East Greece. Uh, Another pretty small figure that's kind of related to the ones that we've seen so far at the Walters is the Palladion Athena. Um, so again, like pretty stiff uh, figure. This would have been an offering in a temple. Um, it was made in Sparta, um, which you guys are probably aware of from movies like 300. Uh, it was kind of like the most militaristic of the Greek city-states. Um, so yeah, it's a cult image. Um, not that dynamic. Um, she, has, she would have had a shield and a spear. Um, so her left arm is kind of weirdly short to compensate for that. Um, one thing to notice about depictions of Athena, um, instead of wearing a muscle cuirass, um, which is basically like a tight fitting uh, metal chest protector, she wears what's called an aegis, um, a protective goat skin um, with the face of a medusa on it usually. Um, it usually has kind of a scalloped or scaly edge. We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, her helmet, um, sometimes referred to as an attic type, um, it is what we would call like an Illyrian type helmet, um, which we saw in the assemblage of the warrior's burial. Um, so yeah, that's the Illyrian type. Um, going back to ceramics, we talked about black figure vessels. These are the different types of Greek vessels. They all had a different purpose. Um, some of them were for storage, some of them were for mixing wine, um, and others were for ointments and then drinking. Um, the kylix that you see at the bottom, which kind of has a dish-like shape, was specifically designed for drinking while you were lying down on a couch um, at a party called a symposium, um, which we'll check out in a minute. Um, the Amasis painter, um, one of the known uh, ceramic painters, um, this is a type of uh, vessel that we talked about already in the Amphora. Um, it's black figure wear. 
um, we can see the god Dionysus um, with two maenads. Uh, and maenads are something that's going to come up a few times. They're basically female followers or worshipers of Dionysus. Um, and they are uh, getting ready to perform a pretty crazy ritual um, in this case. Uh, I'll kind of see if I can zoom in there. Um, we can see uh, Amasis's signature above the rabbit that they're holding. We'll talk about why they have this rabbit. It's kind of a little bit intense a little bit later. Um, but yeah, this is a close up. You can see Amasis, um, his name there. And Dionysus is uh, to the left. And then the main ads are labeled to the right. Um, you can see that Dionysus is holding a type of vessel called the Cantharos. It's a wine cup. He's the god of wine, so that kind of makes sense. Um, you might notice that he has uh, ivy uh, wrapped around his head as a crown. Um, the two main ads uh, have that as well. Um, one of them is holding a rabbit, um, and there's a little antelope uh, in the other hand there. Uh, they're also holding two ritual staffs called uh, thersoi is the plural, and then uh, thersos is the singular. Um, but they're basically like plant staffs, which have that ivy um, wrapping around them. Um, you can see that they're presenting the rabbit to the god Dionysus. Um, what they're going to do with that, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you might notice there's a uh, panther or leopard skin hanging from the waist of one of them. Um, panthers or leopards are a symbol of the god Dionysus. You might also notice that they're being like pretty affectionate towards each other. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the main thing you need to know, maenads are the worshippers of Dionysus. Um, but that's a good example of black figure. We can also see the gender convention. Um, the god Dionysus is shown as dark. The female maenads are the same color as the background. Uh, red figure technique is kind of the inversion of this. Um, this is a uh, black figure, and then this is red figure. So in red figure, they're basically scraping away the slip for the figures, um, really similar to the black figure, just the inversion. Uh, Exequius um, is another uh, black figure painter that we know of. He signed a lot of them as both potter and painter. Um, we looked at the pot um, with Ajax and Achilles at the beginning of the chapter. Um, Red figure uh, had kind of greater freedom, flexibility of detail. Um, we'll check out some other painted pots by other artists. Um, this one that we're gonna look at is by Euphronios. Um, and this uh, is a calyx crater, which would have been used to mix water and wine at a party called the symposium, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it's a pretty nice example of a painted uh, calyx. This is basically a scene from Trojan mythology. Um, the death of Sarpedon, a Trojan warrior. Um, we can see the god uh, Hermes or Mercury um, in the background kind of lamenting the death of this guy. Uh, we can see him bleeding out of his wounds in spite of the fact that he's dead, he's basically being taken uh, to the underworld. Um, but it's a really kind of dramatic and dynamic scene um, that we'll see repeated in later art. Um, early classical period, um, the classical period was always kind of like uh, held to be kind of like the peak of Greek civilization by art historians and historians um, because of the connection to ideas like humanism, rationalism, and idealism. Um, the phases of Greek classical art are kind of separated by formal qualities that reflect these philosophical ideas. Um, this is a period that basically begins uh, after a decisive victory by the Greeks over their enemies, the Persians, it kind of introduces a golden age. Um, there's all these kind of like uh, really influential philosophers that come out of this period. Um, and in sculpture, we see this breakthrough that art historians consider to be really important uh, called contrapposto, um, which is an Italian word, um, basically means that sculpture is breaking out of the rigid Egyptian block-like pose and becoming more dynamic and lifelike. Um, so uh, basically we can see the figures start to shift their weight from one leg to another um, as if they were actually uh, standing there in the sculpture studio. Uh, this figure called the Credios boy um, is a good example of that. Um, it's incomplete. Uh, but we can see that he's less rigid and block-like uh, than the Koros um, that we had seen previously. Um, one leg on the right there is kind of holding his body weight. 
Um, and then on the left, that other one is kind of flexed and relaxing. His head is turned to the side. Um, there's kind of like uh, a shift in his shoulders and hips. Um, so this is what's considered to be the big breakthrough uh, of Greek classical sculpture. Um, bronze sculpture, we can see some of the same stuff. Um, they were using the lost wax process. Um, most of the Greek sculpture that we know of are Roman copies of bronze sculptures. The bronze sculptures were melted down and recycled, um, but the Roman marble copies kind of survived. Uh, this is kind of a cool kylix, uh, that drinking vessel that we talked about. Um, but we can see a Greek bronze foundry, basically. Um, the guys on the left are stoking the furnace um, for melting the bronze. We can see uh, different tools that they would use uh, hanging on the wall behind them, um, as well as the artist's sketches over here, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then over here, we can see uh, an artist kind of hammering uh, on a bronze figure that would have been cast in pieces. Um, and then soldered together. Um, so you can see the head of the sculpture at his feet there. It hasn't been attached uh, to the torso yet. And you can see like a hand and a foot uh, hanging on the wall there. Um, they work naked uh, because it was blazing hot in there. Um, so kind of a cool, cool uh, work of art that gives us an insight into their process. Um, one of the most famous bronze sculptures that survives uh, it's called the Charioteer, um, and this is from Delphi. Um, it's highly realistic. Um, it shows a young man. Uh, the Greeks kind of idealized young men, basically. Um, handsome young men was kind of like their idea of perfection. Uh, the Charioteer is also a young guy because it would have been basically like lighter. Um, his chariot would have gone faster for that reason. Um, but this is a really nice example of bronze sculpture from the period, highly realistic. Um, they use multiple metals, um, copper for the lips and eyelashes, um, onyx, which is a type of stone for the eyes. Um, but there's really fantastic detail, as we'll see. These are the reins um, that would have been attached to bronze horses drawing the chariot. Um, this is a close-up of the face. Um, so we can see he's like very youthful. Um, his beard is starting to come in over here, um, but he doesn't have a full beard yet. You can see the onyx used for the eyes, like very realistic, kind of like the Greek scribe Kai that we looked at. Um, and they've used copper for the eyelashes, um, so highly naturalistic. Um, and there would have been copper on the lips as well. Um, the feet are pretty amazing. We can see the subcutaneous veins on the top of the feet um, and the toenails, uh, all that stuff is in there. Um, the Riace Warriors, another pretty good example of bronze sculpture uh, from the period. Uh, they're older, more mature men. Um, they're so idealized that they don't have tailbones. So like, uh, they're kind of like beyond reality. Um, they also use special materials for the eyes and stuff like that. Um, these were lost in a shipwreck. That's basically why they weren't melted down and recycled. Um, so there's two of them. Um, Riace Warrior A and Riace Warrior B, um, sometimes referred to as uh, the warrior and the strategist, um, although we don't really know who they were supposed to represent. Um, but they kind of represent the Greek ideal, um, athletic, muscular. Uh, these are the two of them standing there. They have been restored somewhat. They would have had uh, shields and spears and helmets originally. Um, those have been lost. Um, so this is the figure called the warrior. Um, we can see he's got that contrapposto stance with his weight uh, shifting from one foot to the other. Uh, he's kind of relaxed, not rigid or block-like. Head is turning to the side. Um, this is the figure called the strategist. Um, we can see kind of the similar pose. This is what they looked like when they were pulled up um, from the bottom of the sea. Um, lots of corrosion and stuff like that. Um, and they've since been restored. Uh, this is the figure called the warrior. You can see some of the different materials uh, used on the face. Um, the lips and the eyes are kind of delineated by different materials. The nipples are also, uh, I think, copper as opposed to bronze, but um, they're delineated that way. Uh, and this is the figure called the strategist. And you can see where he would have been wearing a helmet tipped back on his head. Um, but yeah, they're both highly naturalistic uh, down to the feet. Um, we get this kind of fantastic detail everywhere that would have been sculpted in clay originally um, or wax and then 
uh, kind of cast in bronze. Uh, going back to ceramic painting in the early classical period, um, we'll see that the scenes painted on the ceramics are also, they're often kind of uh, like humorous and scatological um, because they were made for basically an audience of men uh, at these drinking parties called symposia. Um, the one that we're gonna look at is called a sictor, um, which was a type of wine cooler um, made to float in a crater filled with cold water. Um, so basically for keeping the wine cold. Um, this is the sictor um, and it has kind of like a keel at the bottom that would keep it upright uh, floating in the crater. Um, this one's painted by Doris um, and we can see uh, basically a scene related to symposia. Um, we have frolicking satyrs, which are kind of like supernatural beings associated with Dionysus. They're half human, half goat. Um, they are very concupiscent. Um, that is, let's say, like sexually active. Um, we can see that uh, they're all aroused, basically, um, and they're kind of performing like drunken tricks. Um, in this case, we can see one standing on his head, um, and there's a kylix there below him. Um, they all have tails, uh, and they're all kind of like hanging out and partying, um, which is basically what would happen at a symposium. Um, there's a reason why fraternities use Greek letters um, to identify themselves, basically as a reference to these symposia, which were basically like all male drinking parties. Um, although sometimes they would have female sex workers uh, attend them. Um, so uh, the decoration is basically meant to amuse the guests at one of these uh, symposia. Um, and it would have been particularly amusing kind of floating um, in the water of the crater. Um, this is a close up. We can see the satyr uh, kind of like uh, doing the headstand, basically doing like a keg stand, essentially. Um, on the back, we can see, uh, or this isn't really the back, it's another side. Uh, basically, what this is is a wine skin. It's an animal skin uh, that's filled with wine. Um, and this is a pitcher. So they're basically like uh, making this satyr chug the wine out of the goat skin and pouring wine in his mouth. So it's kind of like excessive drinking, basically, what we're seeing here. Um, and this is kind of like the fanciest trick we can see like uh, a satyr uh, performing like a fairly acrobatic balancing act of a cantharos there. Um, hopefully, maybe I should have put a trigger warning there, but hopefully you can handle it. Um, so yeah, there were uh, sex workers that attended these parties. Um, this is another sictor. Um, they would play music. Um, the depiction of the sex workers is kind of interesting. Um, they are really hard to tell apart from male figures. Um, that was just kind of the convention at the time. Um, so yeah, this is a female sex worker um, attending one of these symposia. Um, you can see that she has very broad shoulders, um, although she is kind of clearly female. Um, there was a lot of homoerotic stuff that went on at these symposia as well, as we'll see. Um, so uh, another uh, tondo um, painted by Doris um, was in the bottom of a kylix. Um, and this would have basically uh, revealed itself as the drinker guzzled down the wine, the, the de decoration would have uh, appeared. Um, and there would have been some different meanings for educated revelers to understand. Um, you can see kind of like uh, an interaction between an older man and a younger man. Um, so we can see, yeah, the younger man on the right pouring the wine out into the kylix. This might have been a reference to Greek mythology. Um, Zeus kidnapped a young guy named Ganymede to be his cupbearer on Mount Olympus. Might be a reference to that. Um, but it's basically a reference to relationships between older guys and younger guys. Um, a lot of the other uh, decorations that we'll see are like a little bit more, uh, I don't know, uh, direct. Um, but yeah, uh, you can see how big the Cantharos and the Kylix were. Um, so they, they all held a lot of wine. Um, so people were really getting pretty drunk. Um, 
this is a nice example of kind of the consequences of heavy drinking that hopefully you guys have not experienced personally. Um, but basically we can see uh, a guy walking home from a symposia um, and he's barfing the, the red wine that he's drank up, which is kind of done in red paint on the red figure where there you can see uh, the vomit kind of emerging there. Um, other examples, this one is at the Getty in LA. Um, so yeah, uh, don't drink too much wine. That's the moral of the story there. Um, he's still idealized, even though he's barfing. Um, so you could say that he's vomiting like a hero, um, at least according to Marion True and Jerry Frell. Um, another one here that kind of shows the same thing and also the kind of relationship between the older guys and the younger guys. Um, the guy on the right is barfing um, and his young friend is kind of like, I guess, holding his hair back, comforting him in some way. This is also the bottom of a Kylix. So you would have seen this after you basically chugged all the wine out of the Kylix. Um, so yeah, uh, there's some other examples we can see um, basically having to do with the female sex workers that are uh, playing music. Um, they're not there as guests, they're entertainers. Um, and you can see a quote kind of like talking about the convention of basically making them look like boys with breasts um, this is the Kylix we can see there. So, uh, it's upside down, but you can see two male guests who are definitely happy to be there at the party approaching a female sex worker who has the musical instruments there. Um, this is kind of a humorous one. Um, we can see, uh, a young guy carrying the walking stick and other stuff of an older male guy. This picture was used in drinking contests. Um, and one you can see to the lower right is decorated with flowers. Um, but basically we have a guy uh, walking home after maybe winning the drinking contest. And you can see that his younger friend is kind of assisting him uh, to go to the bathroom um, in a picture that's shaped like the one that the decoration is on. So it's a little bit meta in that way. Um, but yeah, uh, kind of a humorous one. Uh, wall painting. Um, we'll see they made frescoes. Um, this is one called the Tomb of the Diver um, from Poseidonia uh, in Italy. Um, and it shows a symposium scene. Um, there is, there are basically two decorations. One is on the, the kind of like lid or the roof of the tomb and then one is on uh, the wall. Um, but basically uh, we can see guys hanging out at a symposium. Um, lying down on couches together. Um, they're playing music and they're also playing a drinking game um, where they are throwing the dregs of their wine um, at a target in the middle. Um, so basically the wine they drank had a lot of sediment in it. So after you basically like drank your cup of wine, there would be some dregs at the bottom and you would throw it at this metal target um, in the center of the room. But obviously as people are drinking heavily, they're kind of uh, like, start to lose accuracy. So they would basically be hitting um, their companions with the dregs of their wine cup, which would be kind of like fun and amusing. Um, so we can see uh, on this side of the tomb, um, the guys are in the couches together. They have their Kylexes there. Um, this guy in the center um, is flicking the dregs of his cup at the target in the middle. And these guys over here getting like, you know, fairly friendly. Um, so there is kind of like, there's female sex workers. There's also the other guests at the symposium. Uh, everybody's drinking heavily. Um, and for ancient Greeks, none of this was like considered to be like bad or negative. Um, this is kind of a funny, at least it's funny to me. Um, so uh, what we've seen so far, are these kind of like all male drinking parties um, where Women are in attendance, but not as guests. Um, in this vessel, we can see basically like a Greek matron that is like the wife of a, a upright, uh, kind of like upper class Greek citizen. Um, she's chugging wine uh, out of a vessel shaped like the one that she's painted on. And we can see a servant girl bringing a wine skin up from the cellar. So 
the Greek women were not invited to these symp symposia, but they would basically just get drunk at home alone. Um, it's called a skifos, uh, but yeah, um, we can see the matron kind of guzzling out of the skifos. Um, and then on the other side, we can see basically like the cellar of the house um, with uh, wine drinking utensils, amphora, um, and one of those pitchers with the garlands on it from the drinking coast contest um, that we could see. So uh, I just find that one to be a little bit humorous. Um, and you could maybe infer that the servant girl has kind of like a funny expression on her face um, as she's bringing up the wine skin. Um, going back to the tomb of the diver, um, we can talk about the scene on kind of like the lid or the roof of the tomb. It's a young man diving into water, um, and this may be like a metaphor for the passage into the underworld. Uh, the high classical period, this is basically considered by art historians to be the golden age. Um, Pericles was the political leader, um, he paid for a lot of the artwork that we're gonna see. Um, this is the decree relief with Athena um, from the Walters. Um, it's unique in that she's like not armed and very relaxed. Um, you can see that she's leaning on her aegis, her magical goatskin armor um, with the portrait of the Medusa on it. Um, and that's kind of what makes it unique. She's usually shown with a shield um, and wearing her aegis. I uh, can show you some examples of more typical uh, decree reliefs. Um, this was basically made in honor of a foreign resident in Athens. Um, it's made of pentelic marble, which is the highest quality marble, um, basically uh, was used to make the Parthenon. Um, these are other document reliefs. Um, you can see Athena in this case is wearing the Aegis and carrying her shield. Um, that's more typical. Um, another example here, she's leaning on the shield. Um, the idea of her kind of taking off the Aegis kind of has political significance. Um, it basically like connects her to Irene, the goddess of peace. Um, this is another depiction of Athena kind of in a relaxed pose. Um, and this one, um, you can see her wearing the Aegis, although she's kind of rotated it off to the side. Um, she still has uh, the helmet on. Um, so yeah, kind of like a different depiction of her. Uh, the Acropolis is the best example of a Greek temple. Um, it's dedicated to uh, Athena. Um, the Parthenon is kind of like the central feature of the temple, although there are other uh, buildings as we'll see. Um, the Erechtheion um, is a temple dedicated to various deities. Um, and there would have been a sculpture to Athena um, inside the Parthenon itself. Um, it was converted to a church um, at one point and then an arsenal um, when it was blown up during a war of independence against the Turks. Uh, the sculptures on the pediment are now in London. Um, they were removed by uh, British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire named Lord Elgin. Um, you can see that this is a Doric order temple. Um, the capitals of the columns are very simple um, and the columns rest directly on the stylobate. Um, we'll see some other Ionic order buildings that are part of the Acropolis complex. Um, the architects that built the Parthenon um, used a mathematically harmonious ratio. Um, and uh, we'll see, uh, they use this also, the intasis technique that we talked about. Um, and this is the plan of the building. Um, the pediments, uh, like I said, are in London. Um, a lot of them are missing. Uh, this is basically like a photographic reconstruction of what the sculptures on the pediment uh, would have looked like. Um, this figure is either Dionysus or Heracles, we don't totally know. Um, the chariots represent uh, dawn and dusk, the, these are the horses of the chariot kind of coming up in the corners here. Um, that's the statue of either Dionysus or Heracles, uh, various goddesses. Uh, but you can get the sense of kind of like the extreme naturalism achieved by the sculptor um, through the drapery on the female figures. Uh, the Doric frieze depicts, his, depicts uh, this kind of combat between the human lapiths and the centaurs, which is a metaphor for Greek uh, combat against their kind of foreign or barbaric enemies um, that we saw in the geometric period. Uh, the processional frieze um, basically is related to like a religious holiday um, where we can see young men and young women um, advancing up the staircase to the Acropolis. Um, 
the young women are there. Uh, the statue of Athena is gone. This is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like. Um, but you can see her wearing the Aegis with the shield and the helmet. Um, Polyclitos uh, was kind of like the premier sculptor of the classical period. He wrote down um, basically like uh, what's called the canon, um, which is basically like a mathematical treatise on ideal proportion. Um, he's most famous for this sculpture named Doriphoros, um, which would have been bronze. This is a Roman copy. Um, but this is the example par excellence of classical Greek sculpture. Um, we can see that he's an idealized athletic youth. Um, he's got the contrapposto pose, kind of emotionless facial expression. Um, but yeah, this is associated with the high classical period. Art historians usually consider this to be the peak of Greek sculptural production. Um, the Propylia was kind of a gate building. Um, it's the earliest museum that we know of. This is kind of the formal entrance to the Acropolis. Uh, the Erechtheion um, is a good example of Ionic order architecture. Um, you can see uh, the Ionic columns here. Um, this is the Erechtheion. You can see the Ionic order columns there. There's a porch of the maidens on the left there, which has caryatids. Um, but yeah, you can see the volutes on the capitals there, um, and then the caryatids. Uh, the Temple of Athena Nike, um, just a avatar of Athena, um, goddess of victory. You can see her adjusting her sandal. But again, like amazing naturalism with the drapery over the female form. Uh, basically, in Athens and all Greek cities, the marketplace of the Agora uh, was like the public square. Um, this is a reconstruction of what that would have looked like. Uh, city plans were orthogonal or based on a grid. Um, the Priam painter, um, we could see women at a fountain house. Um, this is a type of vessel called a hydria, um, which was associated with women. They would use it to uh, fetch water from a fountain house, like a central source of fresh water. Um, and we can see them kind of uh, in the fountain house collecting water. And this was basically like the only time that they were allowed out of the house to socialize, or I should say one of the only times that they were allowed out of the house um, so they're kind of enjoying themselves to socialize. The other time they were allowed out of the house was basically for Dionysian revels. When they served as main ads, they would go out into the wilderness um, and worship Dionysus um, by drinking wine and doing other things that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, this is uh, an amphora with a musical scene at the Walters. Um, we can see Greek women, uh, like middle upper class women in a domestic setting. Um, taking a music lesson, basically. Um, we can also see one on the left who's opening uh, a scroll box, um, which indicates that they were literate. Um, so this is kind of like an upper middle class Athenian domestic scene. Um, so this is another opportunity for them to socialize. On the back, though, um, we can see women dressed as maenads or female followers of Dionysus. So we can see uh, they're holding Thirsoy, um, and one has uh, a bowl or a vessel there. The other one has a torch. So um, they're kind of like out in the wilderness getting ready to worship the god uh, Dionysus. Um, it seems like they're probably drawn from daily life rather than myth, but there's a contrast between the scene of kind of like domestic intimacy and then the scene of uh, getting ready to worship Dionysus. Um, these are similar vessels. These are Hydria. Um, but what makes this one kind of uh, interesting is we can see kind of like the same scene, um, the music lesson in the domestic space, but we can see the female figure on the left has fully opened uh, the scroll box and is reading the scroll, um, which kind of indicates like the literacy of the figure. Uh, it was probably a wedding gift because it's in the form of the hydra. Uh, Stele, a relief sculpture. Um, these are probably funerary monuments. Uh, other painting from this period, uh, white ground ceramic painting um, is kind of interesting. Um, it's done on basically like a tempera base, a gesso base. Um, they get pretty naturalistic. Uh, late classical, you see like the fall of Athens, they're defeated by Sparta um, and they kind of decline. 
We also see the beginning of the Hellenistic period, uh, basically like Macedonians, um, including Philip the uh, second and his son Alexander the Great, uh, kind of dominate mainland Greece and uh, basically expand in an empire fight a war of revenge against the Persians um, and expand the Greek world here. So this is basically like the greater Greek empire that was constructed under Alexander the Great. So they make it all the way into India, basically. Um, Egypt, all that stuff. All of these become basically uh, satrapies um, dominated by Alexander's generals. They each get like a little chunk of the empire to rule. And we get some interesting uh, hybrid styles of Greek art and local art that we'll see a little bit later. Um, but this is basically what we would call like the Hellenistic period. Um, there's a new canon of proportion uh, developed by this guy Lysippos. Praxiteles is another uh, Hellenistic sculptor. Um, basically what we see with Hellenistic sculpture is uh, kind of like exaggerated uh, realism, kind of realer than real, um, a little bit more dynamic uh, than the kind of reserved or stayed classical period. Um, this is the Aphrodite of Nidos. Uh, by Praxiteles. Uh, this is a nice example of a sculpture by Lysippos, um, where he's basically scraping oil off of himself after an athletic event. Um, this is a Roman copy of an original bronze. Uh, the fig leaf was added later by the Vatican, um, but it's a little bit more dynamic than, say, the Dory Poros. Uh, metal work, we get some pretty sophisticated stuff. Uh, these are earrings that basically show Zeus in the form of an eagle. Uh, kidnapping the boy Ganymede, who he brings to Olympus to be his cupbearer. Um, some pretty fantastic uh, painting emerges from this period. Um, this is a really famous mosaic uh, from Pompeii. That's a Roman copy of a Greek painting. Um, but basically, we can see uh, kind of like the climax of Alexander's war against Persia, um, basically where he captures the Persian emperor Darius III at the Battle of Isos. Um, and you can see Darius uh, in a chariot. All of the Persians have these kind of like yellow hoods on. Um, Alexander is over here uh, to the left, um, kind of riding up on uh, Darius. Um, some other examples of painting that survives in uh, mosaic form, uh, the stag hunt. Um, and the floral pattern that kind of goes around there is called Paucian. Um, so yeah, the Hellenistic period, we get this kind of like mm, individual stylization from the Greek canon. Um, Corinthian capitals are from this period. Uh, they have the acanthus leaves there that you can see on the capitals there. Um, Greek theaters, uh, none of them survive in their original form. Um, this is a reconstruction of one. Um, they're basically like semicircles. There would have been uh, like a stage over here with a backdrop and the audience would have been seated here. Um, the acoustics are supposed to be pretty amazing here. You would have been able to hear what the actors said, um, even up in the back. Uh, this is another shot of one there. Um, the Pergamon is the best example that we have of a Hellenistic temple. Um, it's in what's now Turkey. Um, it's basically dedicated to a victory over Celtic barbarians. Um, and we'll see some examples uh, of depictions of Celtic warriors. Um, the sculptures of Celtic warriors from the temple, they can kind of be distinguished in two ways. They have facial hair. Um, they also have like kind of like uh, grease in their hair that makes it spiky. And they also wear these types of jewelry called torques um, around their necks and sometimes their biceps. And these would have been awarded for military bravery. Um, this is one from France. Uh, a couple other examples of torques. Um, another one there, they're kind of like flexible. Uh, but this is probably like the best example of Hellenistic sculpture. Um, it's called the Dying Gaul or the Dying Gallic Trumpeter. Um, so he's basically like a defeated enemy. Um, and you can see he's wearing a torque around his neck. Um, he's also got a mustache and his hair is kind of spiked up. Um, and you can see that he's bleeding uh, from a wound in his ribs there. And again, this is a marble Roman copy of a Greek bronze original. Uh, but this is a nice close-up. Uh, you can see the hairstyle and the torque, uh, as well as the mustache. Um, one thing that we really see in Hellenistic sculpture 
is there's uh, like a fair amount of emotional expression on the figures. Um, a good example of this is the dying Gaul who kind of like uh, has this sort of intense facial expression, very different than the archaic smile of the dying warriors that we saw at the Temple of Aphaya. Um, another shot there um, where you can see a bloody wound, subcutaneous veins, uh, spiky hairstyle. Um, he's also got his sword on the ground there, as well as uh, a giant like Gallic trumpet. Um, it's kind of circular French horn like thing that uh, they would carry it into battle to make like a terrifying sound basically. Um, this is what the mouth of uh, a Celtic trumpet would look like. And you can see a little bit there that there's like a articulated tongue which would bang around like a rattle. So as the Celtic warriors were kind of advancing, you would hear uh, the rattling tongue, the trumpets blowing. Uh, it would be this kind of like terrifying noise that would uh, intimidate their enemies. Um, and this is another trumpet mouth there. Um, so the Dying Gaul was part of this sculptural group um, where we can see uh, like the leader of the Gauls in the center um, committing suicide after killing his wife and then the various dying warriors around him. Um, he's kind of like the center of the scene. Uh, this is a Roman copy. You can see he's like quite athletic. Um, he's got facial hair, a cape. Uh, his dead wife is kind of slumping in his grip there. We can see that he's in the act of uh, committing suicide rather than surrender to the victorious Greeks. Um, and again, we do get a little bit of facial expression there. Uh, these are the other figures from the group. Uh, we also get a really amazing sculptured frieze around the base of the altar. This is in uh, Germany, in Berlin, um, that depicts basically what we saw at the treasury of the Scythians and the conflict between the Olympian gods and the Titans as a reconstruction of the temple. This is what it looks like today. Um, and you can see a little bit of the sculptural frieze there. Um, but yeah, this is the, con the conflict between the Olympian gods and their predecessors. Uh, the Titans, um, and the Olympian gods are kind of depicted as idealized human figures. Um, the Titans are kind of monstrous, half human, half reptile. Um, but it's a great example of Hellenistic architecture because we get this kind of uh, intense facial expressions, emotive content that we wouldn't have seen uh, in classical Greek art. Uh, the Laocoon, another great example of Hellenistic sculpture. Um, this is a reference to a Trojan priest, um, basically, who understood the threat of the Trojan horse, the deception of the Greeks. Um, the god sent snakes to kill him and his sons, um, even though he worshipped them in the proper way. It's kind of like a metaphor for the capriciousness of fate. Um, but yeah, it's been reconstructed in a few different ways. But um, we get this kind of intense uh, emotive content in the face that we wouldn't have seen uh, in classical art. You can really see the fear uh, in his son's faces. Uh, the Nike of Samothrace, um, another good example of Hellenistic sculpture. Um, this would have been uh, high up on a cliff and constantly being uh, like soaked with water so it would have glistened in the sun. Um, really dynamic figure. We can get the sense of her striding forward. The drapery is kind of like showing her form uh, underneath of it, we can get the sense of the wind blowing. Uh, so yeah, good, nice example of Hellenistic sculpture now in the Louvre. Um, she's supposed to be on the prow of a ship, basically, is what's going on there. Um, but yeah, pretty stunning sculpture. Um, another nice example of Hellenistic sculpture is the old woman. Um, so another difference between Hellenistic and classical sculpture is we get this depiction of old age and what she's supposed to be is basically like a worn out old maenad. So she's a worshiper of Dionysus. The lifetime of drinking has kind of taken its toll um, and that's what we're seeing here. Um, highly naturalistic. Uh, other statues, uh, the famous uh, Venus de Milo or the Aphrodite of Milos, another good example of Hellenistic art um, where we get this kind of like S curve. Um, so that's Greek art. Um, I am going to stop the recording, hopefully.